Well, welcome back to our office and our discussions of computational physics. Today we'd like to talk about parallel computing. And in particular, it should be talked about uh, we, after we've studied some of the high performance computing architecture. So if you haven't heard the lecture yet on high performance computing architecture, that should go back, read about that, hear about it, and then listen to this lecture. And study the book, of course. Okay. So much of today's lecture on parallel computing semantics is just Landau's first rule of education. You remember what that is? That's the rule that most of education is just learning what the words mean. The ideas are almost always pretty simple, but people in the field hide behind all these words they use, so you don't know what the ideas are, so you learn the words. So if at the end of this lecture the words have some good meaning to you, and you can tell that by the end of the, uh, the last slide, let's say, then you, you've learned what we need to learn. You can always go back and see the details and see what they mean again, but it's this overview, this, all these funny words used, and so many of them in this field, that tend to swamp people and say, I, I'm not going to worry about the stuff. So you have to worry about the stuff. This is the future. So let's get on with it. So, parallel problems. There's two problems. One is the basic problem facing scientists today in parallel computing, and the other is the problem you're assigned to do as, as your project uh, for this week. Okay. What we've seen in the last, you name it, three years, decade, uh, is this impressive development of parallel computing power, particularly hardware advances where we used to think parallel computers had, in the 1980s, we talked about six or eight, maybe 12 processors. Now we're talking about hundreds of thousands and maybe you know, more than you know, thousands of thousands processors, literally. Okay? So you know, this is just incredible processing power that has come about. Okay? And when we talk about parallel computing, I should say this goes beyond the kind of parallel computing that you've already seen particularly in that electron high performance computing and architecture, because much of the computing done on even a PC is done in parallel. The I.O. is done in parallel, often while the main processor is doing something else. Memory access is done in parallel. And these risk type architectures, in which one, ha one has a pipeline of instructions, and the pipeline is being filled in one part of the processor, while another part of the processor is clunking away on numbers, okay? That's parallel processing, too. It's several things going on simultaneously. But when we talk about parallel processors and parallel computers, really what we mean is using a number of processors on a single problem at one time. Okay? So it's not, it's beyond the other type of parallel computing. So that's, that's what has advanced so far ahead. So the real problem is that the software to do this is still stuck someplace in the 1960s. Okay? I mean, this is the kind of software similar to what we worked with when we were just starting graduate school. And even then, it was too painful and too slow and too old-fashioned. We didn't keep doing it. You still have to give some very basic, low-level commands to do things about telling one piece of hardware to communicate with another piece of hardware, waiting for the message to come back. You shouldn't have to do this, but the manufacturers have developed the hardware, but they have not worked on the software well enough to make this usable uh, in, in, in a way it should be usable. It is usable, but it's, n it's hard work. So today, uh, what we have are computers in which the message passing mode is the dominant computing, and this is just too elementary. If you don't know what that means, wait until we're done. You still probably won't know what it means, but you'll have a better chance, OK? Why is this the dominant mode? Just like everything else, follow the money. It's the cheapest way of doing it. So we need more sophisticated compilers. Uh, some of that is coming about now with the multi-cores. We have this computer has two cores. Some have four, eight, 12 are coming along so that manufacturers of compilers can take that into account and make take make use of all those cores without you having to worry about it. So that kind of parallel computing is good, 
that's coming along. Okay, but using a hundred thousand different processors, you have to still do that by hand. So one of the challenges physicists face, not just computer scientists, but physicists, is how to parallelize, how to write a program using this hybrid architecture, where you have multiple cores within one CPU on one chip. You also have many, many chips working together. How do you, how do you program for this thing? Well, if I knew the answer, I'd write a book on it and would do, be rich. Nobody really knows the answer how to do this well. It's a research problem, even at this moment. So, your problem, as far as the course goes, not society's problem, your problem is just to take a simple code that you're familiar with and work, run it in parallel. So the logistics map is a very good example because you can break the parameter space into chunks and just have each chunk of the parameter space run on a different computer. You can do that on many of these surveys. You, know, you can have each time on a different computer for something else. So why doing this? Well, you're doing it because I'm telling you to, because you know, it's, it's part of the pedagogy. And it's important for you to do it uh, just to learn about the techniques. In general, you'd want to parallelize a program in order to get it to run faster, or in order to handle a much bigger problem so you can use much larger data sets, or look at things in finer resolution, or look at a different kind of problem that you wouldn't even consider before, because now you have all these processors. So it has to be a big, big problem before this becomes worthwhile, at least to use the multiple cores, so beyond the multiple cores. Let's look on it. OK, so let's look at an example <coughs> of mathematics and why we need to understand the, the need for communication, the need to understand the mathematics, and this need for synchronization. So in equations 1 or 2, we have the basic matrix multiplication problem. <coughs> in equation 1, we have a matrix B is equal to the matrix A times the matrix B. Okay, and then on equation two we write that down component by component. Now in some languages like parallel Fortran or even Fortran 90, uh, as much as possible, you can just write this as a matrix problem and have the compiler do the parallelization for you. That's how it should be. You shouldn't have to worry about too many steps. That being said, the general programming issue in either of these equations is that the B values in red on the right-hand side are not the same as the B values on the left-hand side. So this is not a mathematical equation. Look at equation one. <clears throat> this was a mathematical equation, B with the same on both sides. A would have to be the identity matrix. Okay? So for A not being the identity matrix, this means multiply A by B, and when you're done with that, then go back into memory and store the new values of B as what you got from that product. Okay, It's the same element by element. It says, do this multiplication on the right-hand side of equation 2. And then when you're done, store that as the new value of bij. Except if we're doing that in parallel, you have to be careful. Okay? So you can do each left-hand side element, bij, in parallel, as long as you never touch the current value of bij by your substitution on the right. In fact, you can do each row of the matrix B in parallel, or each column, as long as you don't make this replacement until after all the calculations are done. <coughs> okay, so that's the bugaboo. The right-hand side always has to be the old values before any new values are placed there. So already you can see some of the basics of parallel computing. You need to have communication because the different parts of this matrix have to know when the different processors uh, are done with their part so to see if they can store it there. So you have to have communication, and you have to have synchronization. You have to have the different processors sometimes wait until the slowest guy is done, or the guy was busy with something else. And then you have to understand the mathematics to know that if you don't make that substitute, if you don't wait, you get the wrong answer. And you never want to get the wrong answer in science. That's not why we do computing. So this kind of a problem, matrix B equals matrix A times the same matrix B, is known as a data dependency. 
So that's some of the jargon we're trying to teach you. This is a data dependency problem. It's a problem in which the order of the computation matters. You have to be careful. If you have a new matrix C equal to A times B, aha, that's a data parallel problem. You don't have to worry about it. And so, of course, in reality, you might take C equals A times B as the problem you're solving. And then when you get C, then you substitute that back in B just to solve the problem. But you have to be careful to do that. So let's look at the next slide where we talk about more categorizations of uh, parallel terms, particularly nodes, communication, and so forth. OK. <clears throat> How do you get communication between the processors on a parallel computing computer? Well, two basic ways. The, the CPU can talk to each other to, via reading memory. There could be messages in memory. There could be, it can look at data and say, oh, something's changed here. I know something else has gone on. So that's a type of communication. Or it could be via networks. And these are communication networks uh, of different sorts. So what you see here in the picture, and you might recognize this as coming from the IBM Blue Gene computer, this is typical of a modern parallel computer. There's two internal networks and one external network. So the internal networks, two of them are on top here, and the external networks on the bottom. So on the top, you have this very interesting convoluted sort of helical structure connecting these different CPUs. Why would you even do that? Well, because you like you have a father-in-law in the wire business, and this is a good way of using lots of wires up, maybe. Well, that might be the case, but really what you're trying to do here is have, as much as possible, the same time for communication between any two processors, no matter where they are on the helix. Okay? So you can communicate with some number 100,000 or number 2 in much the same time, and that so you can write software which knows it doesn't have to wait too long if you're using this communication uh, network. If it's a linear communication or a daisy chain, it may take a week before the last guy comes back, and you have to know that. Okay? The, here you have some bigger organizations where you may use this, say, to update memory. Internal memory where you have a server in one place and get it re recording data from memory, putting the new data in as it's needed. So the first one is for more instantaneous communication. The other is slower. And then the third communication, third network, would be, say, with the outside world or with big data servers. You know, so these are the compute nodes in here. Here's fast Ethernet. This is for the I.O., printer, whatever. So different communications. What is a node? A node is just a processor location on a, this communication network. It's easy to say, I want to say, a node is a CPU, but actually, particularly with the modern computers, each node can have multiple CPUs, 1 to n, where n tends to be a small number, at least less than 100. But that's probably changing all the time. So, OK. What kind of problems are there? So we list here these four kinds of parallel problems, or four, four kinds of computing problems that we'll talk about. The easiest kind of computing problem you're familiar with, serial computing, is just a single instruction on a single data. You know, compute one number, boom. When that's done, go ahead, compute another number. Wait. When that's done, compute a third. That's the easiest type of programming. That's the kind you're familiar with. But you can have a parallel version of that where you just give a simple instruction, but it works on data that are in various places simultaneously. So you can just say, add two numbers, A and B. But A and B can be in different places on different computers. It'll still just be a single add, wait for them all to be added, then you can go ahead. That's a little more complicated, but quite reasonable to program. Then you can have the most complicated programming. You can have multiple instructions dealing with multiple data. And this could be a headache to program. Of course, the way you do this, MIMD as it's called, multiple instruction, multiple data, tends to be by sending messages back and forth between the processors, between the nodes. Ah, this is a headache. Okay? So in pure MIMD, there's no shared memory. There's no 
one place where the whole matrix A is. A is distributed every place, and that's a headache. Okay? But that's what we have to deal with. When you hear of clusters, these are typically MIMD machines, multiple instructions, multiple data. It's the most difficult kind to program. Why do we do it? Because they're the cheapest to build. Uh, manufacturers used to have these simple, instru uh, simple inst instruction, multiple data kind of computers. They literally cost millions of dollars. And then suddenly, if you can use off-the-shelf hardware, just PCs for the different nodes, you could, for 100,000 or 40,000, you could get similar performance, and they won the game. So now everything has gone MIMD, different programming, but that's such as life. Okay, so let's step back. A lot of words. Let's look at some other words. You're probably familiar with some kinds of parallel programming if you're familiar with multitasking. Now, multitasking is done on many PCs. It's done by the Unix operating system in particular. And it has similarities to parallel. So in multitasking, <coughs> we have here in, in this, this circle with the yellow sectors, we may have four programs, A, B, C, and D, all loaded simultaneously in memory. So, uh, for example, the reason you can see all these windows on a desktop, here I only have one, but they're all, you know, there's a lot of them there. There you can see there's a whole bunch of windows, a whole bunch of desktops. The reason I can have all of those working on a non-parallel machine is that they're all in memory at the same time. And, you know, and when you're asked to do something, you're asked in any one window, that is, uh, the processor goes to that window and does something. So in general, it's a round-robin order. The processor goes around, asks each program in memory, do you have anything for me to do? If not, the processor goes on to the next guy. And it may seem like it's doing many things in parallel, but it's really going round order, giving each one a little bit. Okay, so that's round robber processing. In a single instruction, a single data machine, it's only doing one job at a time. It's doing A, it's doing B, C, or D, but not all of them. In a MIMD machine, you can have all of these jobs in memory, and they all are working simultaneously with each other. Okay? So that's a more... That's parallel processing. So, the next slide. Look at the next slide. More semantics, but, you know, if we're going to talk to each other, we have to understand the words. Another way of describing parallel computing is by the granularity. Now, I like this because it's not the computer as much as your problem. And as a scientist, you're concerned with your getting your problem solved correctly. So, so granularity talks really talks about how uh, talks about the the problem of, of putting your computer to solve your particular problem. Okay, so it's a measure of the computational work that must be done to solve your problem. But really, more than that, it's a measure of the computational work divided by the communication work. So, if you have a lot of computation, a very little communication, you have high granularity. Okay? So coarse grain, which would be high granularity, would have separate programs and separate computers. Okay? That's very coarse. That's the easiest type to program. For example, you might be running a Monte Carlo calculation on six Linux PCs. So that's a coarse grain. It's the same calculation running on six PCs. And when you're done, you just add all the results together. It's a coarse grain problem. That's nice to do. Okay. The, the most simple coarse grain problem would be trivial parallel, all the same program. Okay. Medium grain is more typical of what you get on clusters now. You may have several simultaneous processes running on the same problem. When you have that, obviously, the processes have to communicate with each other. They communicate via a bus, which is just I don't know, a bundle of wires put together where the uh, processes can talk to each other. Or you can talk to the I.O. system, whatever. <clears throat> if you have parallel computation, particularly medium grain, it's often done by having parallel subroutines. So you take your basic subroutine and you break it up each to run on different CPUs. Those are called parallel subroutines. It could be the same subroutine. There could be a slight variation. 
the subroutine may say, am I on processor one or two? Whatever. Beyond that, you have fine-grained parallel. This is the nicest for a scientist because you don't have to do it, and this is where the compiler would figure out how to uh, run in parallel. So right now, the Intel compiler is designed to run on the multiple cores in the CPU are a good example. They can do fine grain because the person who's writing the compiler figures out how to use the different cores on any one executional statement and, the, and it's done. Okay? You can have fine grain example being different parallel computations for different loops in the same program, loop by loop. You wouldn't want to, want to do this by hand, but it's okay for the compiler. So, some more semantics. Let's look now at a computer. So look, particularly enjoy the next slide. <coughs> so let's talk about clusters, also called multi-computers, also called Beowulfs, also called Davids. Beowulf because a legendary character who fought off the bad guys. David because a biblical character who knocked off the big giants of IBM, Cray, etc. Okay. So, <clears throat> what, what do we have? On the left, we have a lot of fish. Okay. So, on the right here in this picture, you actually can see photographs, three different photographs of different Beowulf clusters. And what do they look like? They look like rack after rack of PCs, in this case, rather, rather dated looking PCs. Uh, just put on racks and communicating with each other. That's all the cluster takes. Okay. So this is the dominant mode now, at least for coarse grain work. Uh, all you need is hundreds, thousand PCs that you can buy cheap. You need a high speed switch so you can communicate between all of them or among them because they go on simultaneously. You need some software to uh, have messages passed back and forth, and you need a communication network to put the piece together. So obviously you then as a programmer have to take your data or your processing, break it up into chunks, and distribute a good sized chunk to each machine. So the work involved is just that, deciding what to do, sending data out to the nodes for it to compute with, getting the data back, putting all the pieces together. So when you're done, what you have and what's taken is all these little PCs have actually eaten up, done away with almost all of the bigger computers of different kinds. Now they all tend to be this mode. So look at the next slide. What's the issue and what do we have to talk about? <coughs> well, let's talk about Amdell's Law and the, uh, it's discussed in the book. Let's look at the conclusion of Amdell's Law bef before we try to derive it. Because the de derivation is quite simple. But what Amdell's Law is like is you know, what it used to be like when I was a freshman in a dormitory. There'd be a, you know, a food line. There'd be these women slapping mashed potatoes down on a plate. You know, everybody would try to get out of there as quickly as possible. But there was a ketchup dispenser with some relish stuck in it. And the ketchup would barely come by out. And everyone had to wait until the ketchup dispenser was got enough ketchup out. So it didn't matter how fast the mashed potatoes were being slapped down. What mattered was the slowest step in the line. So as is true for chemical reaction work as well, the rate determining step is often the slowest step. Exactly the same thing is true for computing. If you have a program which is a mixture of serial, something that has to be done one step at a time, and a things that can be done in parallel, then the serial part is what slows you down. And the more serial you have, the slower it gets. So if you look at Amdell's law here, you look at this uh, graph. Let's look at it graphically. So this is the speed up. In other words, how much faster it is to get your program running on a parallel machine than it would be on a single processor. And this is the percent P, as it's called, the percent parallel of your problem. This is a speed up of 4, speed up of 8. And let's say here, let's take a speed up of about 3. And to get a speed up of 3 on a machine that has two processes, you'd have to wait forever. Okay? So speed up of 3 here, we get blue. 
which would be two, four, two, four. That would be six, okay? So you'd, you'd have, if your program was 80% parallel and you were running on six computers, then you'd get a speed up of three. But only three, half of what you should get. If you have 16 computers, you'd get a speed up of about five. So that's a, went from about a half to about a third, okay? And if you had an infinite number of computers, you'd still get a speed up only of seven. So, who? In other words, that's not very impressive because it takes you quite a while to get a program in parallel. And so the rule of thumb here is, unless you have about 90% of your program in parallel, don't bother wasting your time figuring out how to do it. Just run it on a serial machine or whatever you have and leave it at that. If you're going to massively parallel with 1,000, 100,000, 100,000 compilers, you essentially need 100,000, uh, you essentially need 100% parallel because it's not worth it otherwise. And, pro and many in the field say, don't even bother taking your problems and putting it on a parallel computer. Think of new problems which have to be solved on parallel only, and that's where it's the best investment of time. Okay, that's not totally true. If, it, if you have to wait for weeks or days for your output, then it might be worthwhile. So, I'll go through this quickly. The Amdel's law of derivation, it's in the book. It, it's, what's important is not the final formula, because you've seen the curve, but it's just common sense. P is the number of CPUs we're using on a problem. T1 is the time it takes, T for time, one for one, to run on one CPU. Tp is the time it takes to run on P CPU, so P for parallel. Sp is the speed up, so that's the maximum speed up you can get would be T1, the time on one processor, divided by the time it takes on all P. So if ideally, if, if you have P processors, it should only take one P of the time, we should get a speed up of P. As we see, because you have serial or also because we have communication, that's never true. So in Amdel's law, we deal with f, which is the fraction of your program that's in parallel. That's all. Okay? So we define all these terms. If f is the fraction of your code in parallel, the time for serial is just 1 minus f, the fraction in serial, times the time it takes to run on one processor, because your serial code will only run on one processor, definition of serial. And likewise, parallel is the fraction on parallel times t1 over p. So Amdel's law just adds all this all up together, and we just get this fraction. And that's what you saw on the last slide. Okay. The next slide is more interesting and more relevant, and you know how to do it. What if we talk about communication overhead? Now, when Amdel wrote down his law, it was the good old days of parallel computers and vector machines when there may have been five or six computers, multi-million dollar machines, and they communicated very fast with each other over very high speed networks, or only through central memory, which was as fast as the computer. Okay. Well, once you put communication in, we have to deal with what's known as a latency. And this is, well, the communication time. This is the time it takes to move data. So if we look up, look at our equation for speed up, which was T1, the time it takes for one processor, divided by the best case possible. So we're not, not being practical here. We're saying the best parallel you can get is T1 over P. You won't get that, but that's the best. Just add in the communication time. So this is the best case scenario. And what this tells you is that for communication time not to matter, then you have to have the time it takes divided by the number of processors, time on one, has to be much, much greater than communication time. That's right. Once communication time becomes large, then you have to worry about it. So it limits the number of processors that you can use on any one problem to be much, much less than T1 over Tc. Okay? So as the communica communication time gets larger and larger, the number of processors you can use gets smaller and smaller. And you can think of it the other way around. This numbers are wonderful, right? <clears throat> if you just in look at equation one, if you just in keep increasing the number of processors, P, 
at some point when T1 over P approaches communication time, then the more processes you add on, the slower the computation comes. That's right. So at some point, as you keep adding more, more processors on, all you do is slow down the total time it takes because the processors are being kept busy communicating with each other. So this is an example of how a faster CPU becomes irrelevant to parallel computing. And likewise, any problem which requires lots of communication means that you can't use all that computing power which the manufacturers are giving us. So we'll see that again and again. Okay, so how do you actually parallelize a program? So let's take a little break now. We'll come back. This is now how you get down to the nuts and bolts. Welcome back to our discussion of parallel computing. Now we're getting down to the nitty gritty, the nuts and bolts. Uh, how do you actually parallelize a program? So what we see on this slide is the typical structure of a parallel program. What you have is various tasks that have been set up by the user, not the computer. So you have your main program task. This is your controller, if you can think of it as your master. And then you have a main routine, which gets to work. The first thing you do here, anyway, is you get all the serial work done, so then you can get on to the parallel work. Okay? And the, you separate off the program, uh, so the serial work is fine. Sometimes you have serial work at the end as well. So you get your serial work done, then you have various slaves, various processors working on different parts. So these are called the parallel subroutines. You can have any number of them. They work in parallel, and when that's done, then you have the serial part, summing up the results here, combining them. And then you're, you can repeat this model again and again as your problem needs. But as I've said, if you have lots of breaks for serial processing, then it won't be very fast, because that'll take up all your time. Okay? So you can see here what's important. Uh, we have to break up the tasks in the parallel. You have to have communication among all the different parallels. You have to have synchronization. And finally, you have to be careful not to sacrifice the science to the speed. So it's easier to speed up the programs by not requiring synchronization, but you may get the mathematics wrong. Okay. Well, here you see some of the practical aspects of message passing. The most wise advice is don't do it. Okay. Unless you have to, don't do it because it's messy, it's hard, it's work. Uh, unless you, or unless you have some very nice, simple problems, this embarrassingly parallel, then you can do it. The more processes you have to deal with, the more challenge there is. Only your most numerically intensive problems should be attempted in parallel. If you don't need to do parallel, don't do it. Uh, beware, often these very big programs that you may encounter to run on parallel uh, work in Fortran, sometimes Fortran 90, sometimes in older Fortran versions. Uh, so you have to have some familiarity with Fortran or C. Those are the primary languages one would use in parallel, at least for massively parallel. Then one has the choice. The computer science community says, no question about it, the best thing to do is to take your program and rewrite it from the ground up in order to run in parallel. That's the only way to make it really good. Uh, but beware, that might take months or years to do, particularly if it's a big code. And you wouldn't want to run it in parallel unless it was sort of a complicated code. If it's a simple code that just has to run for a long time, then it's easy. Uh, maybe about 70% of all parallel programs, at least the surveys show, are really modified serial codes. So in practice, that's what you do, but it's hard. You know, it's, okay. Why is it hard? Well, there's a steep learning curve. Uh, there's various failures that can occur because you have to do some of the hardest things on a computer, which is have the CPU communicate with different pieces of hardware. So it's not just software you have to deal with other CPUs, maybe other operating systems or other forms of the operating system. And then you get bugs, and it's hard to debug because the bug can occur in various places on different machines, and you have to sort of get that information back. So the preconditions for parallel is probably a code that you run often enough that the speed matters. 
a code that maybe runs for days so that you have to wait around a long time otherwise, and a code that you don't change very much from run to run. Because once you get all the changes made to run on parallel, you don't want to touch it too much. Okay? A good example is a code that runs, but you need much higher resolution than you dealt with before. Or a molecular dynamic kind of simulation, which runs well, but you need to include many more bodies. Rather than 100, you need 100,000. Well, then parallel makes good sense. But the th message so far has been the kind of problem you run really affects the kind of parallelism you can use and whether you can use parallelism. Each problem has to be analyzed. Analyzed for its data structure, analyzed for how you program uh, it up to solve the mathematics. Okay? Uh, <clears throat> the easiest, the most appropriate kind of problem to run on a parallel computer is what's known as perfectly or embarrassingly parallel. And this could be that Monte Carlo calculation, which just has to be run many times. And then you can just, rather than running it many times, run it once on many computers and add the results up. Okay? That's embarrassingly parallel. That's a good idea. Most of the problems you see running now are like that. Other kinds of problems would be a fully synchronous problem. So that's where you have uh, something like molecular dynamics, and it's tightly coupled together. In other words, each particle there is interacting with a force with the each other particle at some time t. So you can't have one particle run ahead you know, for time equal to 10,000 t, because the other guys have to still be interacting with it, and they can't read the future. So, uh, and then that particle simultaneously has to interact with all the others. So there's some lag there, but it has to be tightly coupled. So that's a uh, typical fully synchronous problem. <coughs> Loosely synchronous problems might be something like groundwater diffusion, where you can have one part of the code do the physical transportation, another part can do the chemical effects, or can be different regions of space. Then they interact, different regions interact with each other. You can go ahead and do that. So that's more loosely parallel. And then another kind of parallel is pipeline parallel. Uh, there's a lot of this going on. The graphics processors are designed to do this kind of thing, because that's where you may be making movies. You start off with data, you take the data, convert it into an image, and then you take those images, convert it into animations. Obviously, you can't make the animations directly from the data. You have to have the images. You have to wait. Everything has to be moving along. And that's the kind of calculation you can do in parallel, do it well, but you have to break it up into pieces and have them flow through. <clears throat> so let's take a nice high level view of message passing. This is the dominant mode. So let's look at the next slide, please. <clears throat> and this slide shows a simple case. We have a master that con controls everything, sends out commands to create, to compute, receive, send, uh, transmit. Then you have two slaves doing all the work. And the good news is that most Everything you have to do can be done with four commands. So you run your C or your Fortran program as before. You don't really change it. What you do is you add commands in for communication. And the only four communication commands needed, they're, they're, there's probably more, but the most essential ones that you need is send to send a message out. You need receive to receive a message by any sender. Um, that's enough. My ID. You have to have a command so that your program can ask, who am I? Okay, so then I know which processor I'm working on. That's my ID. Then you need to know the number of nodes communicating with each other. Okay, because you can't, you have a problem, you have to know how, if you want to break it up into pieces, this is the number of pieces, you can break it up. You have to know that. But this is all that you need to know. So message passing is pretty simple in that sense. It's all send received, but you have to process it. Uh, what can go wrong? Who? Well, a lot can go wrong because we have to have the different tasks cooperating with each other. You have to have a division of work so that each task is kept busy. It has, you know, called load balancing. It has enough work to keep going while another one is kept going as well. And you have to divide the data up correctly. If you make a mistake in that matrix multiplication and you have two processes computing the same thing, uh, you can get the wrong answer. Okay, so you have to divide that up. 
Obviously, there's lots of low-level details to take care of. And those error messages can occur different places. You may not see them. They may not tr be transmitted back. It, it's important to worry about that. You can have a wrong messages order. So you can make mistakes. You can say, you're trying to synchronize this. You have to send these messages out. They have to come back in, in a certain order, or you're in trouble. Well, if you've written a program like that, then you can have a program which depends on the order. Okay. That's known as race conditions, where the, order, where the uh, results you get depend on the order in which different processes work. That's obviously a fault. You want to avoid that. You have to build in synchronizations to stop that. Maybe worse, maybe not as bad, is deadlock, when one processor waits forever. It's bad because you won't get any output, but it's good because you don't know you get no output, you know something's wrong. That's better than having output which is wrong. So those kind of things can go wrong. <clears throat> so let's conclude now. Let's see if some of this makes sense to you. So we can go back here and look at a parallel computer and look at the pieces and what it does. So this is the IBM Blue Gene computer, obviously designed for genetic work originally, but used all over, even in banks. And it's like a parallel computer designed by committee, because you have various committee members, each one interested in some different aspect, and it's a compromise. You know, it does many, many things, but it does many things well, and then it's all put together very well. So it, you know, lots of work has gone into this. One of the aspects that's very important, and you may not have thought so at first, is how much performance you can get per watt of power. Because what's happened is, as you make the processors faster and faster, the chips smaller and smaller, the amount of power at some point was reaching the level of the power density with inside a nuclear reactor. And you know that's just too much heat to generate, to remove. And the processors, as you may know, sped up and actually now they've slowed down because the fastest ones are just too hot to cool. They use too much energy, they cause too many failures. So that is, uh, was a concern in building this machine. And so what you'll see is 5.6 gigaflop processors, which are fast by PC standards maybe, or maybe not when you're viewing this anymore, but they're fairly cool. Okay. There's memory. There's memory on each individual chip central processing chip and off chip. Off chip obviously so you, cause you need a lot of memory, but having memory on chip means, oh, communication is right there. Okay, so it's very fast. And in fact, the latest, uh, at this moment, IBM architecture for the petascale machines being built has uh, a NICS card, the network interface communication mixed into the central processor card because communication is so important that you have to speed it up. So that's very important. This one had two cores per CPU, in other words, two processing units on the CPU itself. They modernized this, there's 4, 8, 12 coming up. Here, one core was used for communication, one core was used for processing. Okay, so that's this modern idea of on a parallel machine, they're both very important. And even the PCs now have multiple cores, so it's another approach. How many processors on their basic machine? 2 to the 16th, which is over 65,000 nodes. Okay, this is just nodes. Uh, what's on a node? Well, you can have. We'll come to that. Okay, this gives us 360 teraflops, 10 to the 12th uh, floating point operations a second. Incredible number, but uh, <coughs> of course, it's just if you can get a problem, which requires everything. Uh, the speed of, the, as we said, of the individual processor is just medium. There are 512 chips on a card. There are 16 cards on a board. And the whole thing is controlled with this programming language, MPI, which we have a tutorial on in the book. So here we go. This is the two chips on any one, uh, two processes, rather, on any one chip. And then each card has two chips. The cards are put together, 16 cards on a board. The boards are placed inside cabinets. 32 boards each and 64 cabinets. So it's a, it's a big array, a big machine. Uh, this is what can give us 
these incredible performances. So that's all. Uh, go, you may want to go through this lecture another time. Make sure you understand the words. And then the MPI tutorial is in the book for you to read about, try out, to try out a parallel machine. Thank you. See you soon. Bye-bye.